All right, do me a favor. Make sure you hang in till the end of the video. This is not a long one, but it actually has a twist to the end. Um, it doesn't turn out like it looks like it's going to as you're midway through the video. So um, if you haven't already, please go check out my website, hvacrvideos.com. We've got lots of cool merch available on there, um, hat, shirts. This is actually one of my, this is my original design. This is my big picture diagnosis shirt. Um, this one is one of my favorite colors because it has the teal blue, um, and I really dig that color. Uh, it's a really cool design, so definitely go check it out. Uh, you guys can support the channel on there. We got beanies, hats, uh, sweatshirts. We have the flag t-shirt design, so check it out. This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Today we have a call on a true two-door region that is not working right. So looks like the control's been converted. It's not really the right control, but it'll work. But uh, we gotta figure out what's going on here. So the customer says it's about 60 degrees and that's about accurate. So the sequence of operation is the temperature controller should be turning the compressor on. The evaporator fan motor's running. Um, it's not iced up. And I can hear the condenser fan motor running. So that means that the temp control is telling it to turn on. So we're gonna start at the compressor section. I can hear the compressor clicking on and off on internal overload. Let's see if I can catch it. There it went. Um, condenser had a nice filter on it, but it's actually pretty dirty inside. It just shows you that just because the surface is clean doesn't mean that the condenser is clean all the way through. So we're gonna go ahead and try to get this out. There's not a lot of room in here and we gotta investigate the starting components and get to the side of the compressor so we can test to see if it's bad. Someone, I don't, I guess it might be factory, but the cord that plugs in the compressor goes all the way back there. It's that gray cord. It's so short that I can't get it out. I managed to find the breaker and turn off power, but it's going all the way back there. And I think it plugs into a receptacle, but I can't get into here. It's like, what a mess, man. I might have to just cut the cord off just to be able to diagnose it. I was able to get it unplugged, but good luck getting it plugged back in. I'm gonna probably have to put a longer cord and put like quick connects on it or something, I don't know. But okay, so now we're gonna get in here to the compressor, open it up, check the start cap, and then uh, ohm out the compressor terminals to see what's going on. One thing that sucks about these things is, is once you take this off, it's almost impossible to get them back on and get all the wires that they have crammed in there wrapped back around by the time you take it off. So remember, I have unplugged this, there's no power in here. So I don't see any signs of burning. It's gonna be a good indication that we're probably gonna end up having bad starting components or a locked up compressor. So we're just gonna disassemble it. This relay should pop right off. No burning, definitely dirty. Here's what was clicking, the overload. Yeah, that doesn't even wanna come out. All right. There it goes, there's the overload. It's a bimetal disc. And when it heats up, it pulls away and breaks the common leg to the compressor. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and start with our start cap then. So the capacitor should have 145 to 175 microfarads. So we're gonna test that real quick with the meter. Um, field piece meter, just put it on microfarads. Does a pretty good job, so, all right. And looks like we have a bad start cap. So let me go see if I have one. We'll test fire this. I'm gonna come back in with the OEM starting components and I don't just change the capacitor. I change all the starting components, including the clicks on, but I might be able to put something on here just to get them running. I got a three in one on here temporarily to see if we can start it up. And I ended up having to make a longer cord. What's silly is I had to pull this receptacle off the wall. Let's see if you guys can see that, see this? I had to manage to yank the thing off to be able to plug it in. It's kind of silly. This compressor, by the way, is smoking hot. I don't know if it'll start or not. Probably has a lot to do with that bad, dirty condenser, too. It's probably got plug cap tubes. This thing's sealed, though, so it's gonna be fun. All right, power's turned back on. We're gonna fire this guy up, see what happens. Fired up. That's the inrush. See what the normal current is. Seven amps, Whew, it's awfully high, man. Let's let it run for a little bit and see what happens. We're gonna also clean up that condenser for him. Trying to eliminate the mess. I've got it sitting in a pan. Give it a good rinse with hot water first, then I'll get some coil cleaner on there. It's not gonna be perfect, 
I'm not going to take the condenser fan blade out or anything like that at this time. So just try to get it, most of the bulk of the nastiness out. It's definitely cleaner. I mean, in a perfect world, I'd love to take that condenser out and go hit it with a hose. But yeah, current draw went down a little bit. So we're going to let the unit run for a while. We're definitely ordering starting components. But the question is, is it, uh, does the unit have plugged up capillary tubes? That's going to be hard to tell. Um, and I'd rather not have to put service fittings on it if I don't have to, so we're just gonna let it run and see what happens, and then uh, I'm gonna watch it for a little bit. All right, my box is dropping in temp. Um, I've got a cool suction line coming back. I've got a hot discharge line. Don't stick your hand in the condenser fan motor, Chris. And a warm liquid drain coming out the condenser. I'm displacing heat. Um, it's still gonna take a while, it's at 68 right now, so. I'm gonna watch it for a bit and then I'll probably end up uh, ordering the starting components and then uh, just seeing if they have any more problems in the meantime. Uh, just because it's gonna take at least an hour and a half to come down to temp, so I'm not gonna sit here and wait. All right, this is why we let it run for a bit. Uh, the compressor's locked up, no current draw, we've got voltage. It's not running anymore, so it's locked up. So we're gonna end up doing a compressor replacement and uh, we'll probably, because we know it has gas in it, We'll probably end up uh, changing the capillary tube also at the same time, so it's going to be a nasty one. It's a little difficult to show, but what I actually did was shut the unit off and then ran my leak detector in here, and I was picking up the trace, uh, a trace of a leak in the evaporator too. So with that being said, um, we're going to submit a proposal to change the condensing unit, to run a new capillary tube and accumulator, and put a new evaporator coil. Um, we'll see. If that's something the customer wants to do, I would highly suggest they change this box. But, you know, that's all their opinion to make. And I don't even sell them the box. They buy them themselves. But we'll give them a quote and see where they want to go. We really, really have to take the time to make sure we watch these boxes operate, okay? After I got it started up with the 3-in-1, it took a crap after it ran for about seven, eight minutes. And what was interesting was it was showing good vital signs, okay? Um, again, not being able to put my pressure ports on there, uh, the suction line was getting cold. We were displacing heat out of the condenser. We had a warm liquid line. Everything seemed okay. The box temperature was creeping low, but it was already, you know, I mean, they had the box shut off when I got there. So it was going to take a long time, but, and then in letting it run for a little bit longer, then the compressor just locked up and turned off, okay? It's really important. Now, I also want to address something too. I'm not a huge fan of using the three in one uh, start kits. Okay. Um, it contains a start capacitor, uh, a thermal overload and a potential relay basically inside of it. The reason why I'm not a fan of using them, even though I did use it in here, the reason why I'm not a fan of using them is they're universal, right? And if you look on the packaging, it says like for one third to half horsepower compressor. But what's interesting is as you get on the bigger compressors, especially the half horsepower one, um, what you start to notice is the, the start cap that comes with the compressor. If you actually pull the stickers off of that three in one, that's an actual legit start cap. It's usually a lot lower, uh, microfarad rating than the factory OEM start cap. So I will often use them just to start a compressor up to make sure that they operate, but I'm not a fan of permanently leaving them on there because I consider them to be compressor killers. Okay. Now I realize a lot of people swear by them and so be it to each their own. I personally, once I get a compressor running and it, and you know, and it starts running, I'll usually like to watch it come down to temp or something. And as long as everything's okay, then I order the factory OEM starting components and come back and put on the OEM starting components. Very important too. When you're replacing starting components, you always want to replace the, uh, uh, the thermal overload also, or the clicks on relay. Okay. Um, because, uh, in my, this, again, my personal opinion, just from experience, uh, it just tends to bite you in the butt. So when I sell starting components, I sell them as a package, me personally, okay? I go to the manufacturer, the compressor, I believe this was a Tecumseh compressor, so I'll go to my local supply house and get the, all three starting components, the relay, the overload, and the capacitor, okay? And if it has a run cap, I do that too. Um, in my opinion, that's just good practice to do it that way. Um, it's almost like cheap insurance, kind of like, why do you change a run cap every single time you change a condenser fan motor, even though you measure it, it's like, they're so cheap. Why not? You know, uh, the starting components just again, as a good measure, I always sell starting components as a kit. Okay. Now in this one, 
I did use the three in one. It started the compressor, but you notice right when it started, I said, hey, this thing's running high amps. Now, I actually didn't even look at the box amps, but just seven amps seemed really high. Uh, just from experience, I would expect that thing to be running in the four amp range, not the seven amp range. Now, granted, it was under a load, okay, but it just seemed odd to me. And then as we progressed through the call, obviously the compressor locked up and turned off, okay? So in this situation, um, I also predicted that the capillary tubes were likely plugged up, okay? Again, from experience, this is a 134A system. The condenser was dirty. It wasn't maintained. The compressor wasn't starting. Uh, the odds were that we had plugged up capillary tubes too. The only thing that would have told me that is if I would have applied service gauges and I could have seen the operating pressures, okay? But I didn't even apply service gauges to this because, again, looking at the big picture, even though the compressor was bad, I still, because it's like, hey, just turn the box off real quick. And I took my leak detector and I ran it behind the evaporator. It's a sealed system. And I was picking up traces of a leak. Very common on these things, okay? So... I was able to quote that appropriately. Now, let me tell you, had I just quoted the compressor, more than likely, we would have came out. I still probably would have changed the cap tubes. But then when I was pulling the evacuation, more than likely, I would have realized, hey, we're low on gas. There's a problem. and Or I mean, uh, you know, there, it's not pulling down. And I probably would have found a leak. And then I would have had to go back to the customer after that. All that work was done and say, hey, we need to put another couple thousand dollars into this or whatever it is. Change the evaporator coil too. Okay, so... I always, to the best of my ability, try to give the customers a big picture diagnosis. That way they can choose whether or not they want to do a big picture repair. And remember, I say this all the time. It's okay if they don't do the big picture repair. So long as I do my due diligence, give them all the information and let them make those decisions, then it's not my problem anymore. I asked them and I said, I suggest you do this. They chose not to do it. I have it in writing. No problem. I'll write them another bill, give them another quote when we have to do more work. But for me... I feel guilty if I didn't do my due diligence and look at as much as I can when I gave them that initial quote, okay? So um, I have some other rules of thumb when it comes to big repairs, like on a cap tube system, 134A, if I have a bad compressor, they're getting a cap tube too, okay? The reason why the cap tubes, in my opinion, fail is because the, the, the combination of the polyester oil, um, the dirty condenser, it starts to break down the oil in the system and we get restricted capillary tubes. It's a very common issue. Now, the only way to truly solve the restricted cap tube issue, especially if it's a severe restriction, is to change the compressor and get all the oil out of the system, okay? Um, in my opinion, the best bet on this little tiny region would have been to um, change the entire condensing unit. And actually, um, my experience with true manufacturing, they actually recommend that too. If you have restricted capillary tubes and you have a bad compressor, um, even if it's under warranty in my experience, and you guys got to verify this on your own, and I've said this before recently too, uh, if you have a failed compressor under warranty through true, you can actually ask them for an entire condensing unit and they will usually ship you the entire condensing unit. Now, don't take just what I said, but try it next time. You know, Next time you have a failed true compressor, call them and say, hey, you know what? I want the whole condensing unit. And they will usually ship out the whole unit, even if it's just the compressor replacement. Uh, in my opinion, the reason why they do that is they realize with the whole capillary tube issue and stuff that, you know, they, they can solve these problems if they just go ahead and change everything, okay? Uh, as far as the condensing unit versus just the compressor. Um, so I always try to change the capillary tubes on compressor replacements whenever we have a 134A system just to mitigate some problems and then obviously try to get the condensing unit whenever possible. Now you saw that whole entire unit too. You saw how the, the, the cardboard around the condenser fan motor was failing and stuff. Um, another cool tip, I don't think a lot of people realize this, uh, actually two of them, True Manufacturing, they're actually pretty decent to work with. They will sell you a condenser shroud for a lot of these regions too. If you're working on the True freezers and stuff, you can actually get an entire shroud and it's like a new metal shroud that like goes in place of the cardboard. You just rip off the cardboard and the new metal shroud. So if you ever have one where the cardboard is missing, like in mine, or it was really deteriorated, you can actually sell them a shroud and it's really not a huge expense, okay? Um, another cool tip, oh, I just lost my train of thought there. I was going to say something else with them too. Um, but yeah, true. I, I really dig them for that. They seem to do a very good job about being proactive with their, um, warranty stuff and with the parts. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to say, uh, with the capillary tubes too. 
Uh, remember, all of these regions that have cap tubes on them, they're typically going to have an accumulator on them too, right? On the suction line just coming out of the evaporator. You can actually order an entire line set kit from True that comes with the capillary tube already attached to the suction line because they always do that for a sub cooling for efficiency and it'll actually have the accumulator already on it and everything and you can usually just pop the line set through and do everything so i really dig true for making those kits to make it a lot easier okay i've rambled enough i really really appreciate you guys making it to the end do me a favor like i said in the beginning check out my website hvacrvideos.com i know i'm harping on that but it really does help to support the channel and to be honest with you i think i said it on the last one too i ordered i ordered way too much merch the last time i have stacks and stacks of it and i need to get it out of my office so do me a favor check out the website if you're interested in it if not no big deal okay don't sweat that i'm not pressuring you guys to spend money with me but i mean if it's something that interests you just check it out hvacrvideos.com Remember, I do live streams on Monday evenings, 5 p.m. Pacific on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, and also go live with the HVAC Overtime crew, my buddies, Bill, Adam, and Joe, uh, over on Friday evenings about 6.05 p.m. on the HVAC Overtime YouTube channel. So definitely come check that out and hang out with us, and uh, we will catch you guys on the next one.